Hi, hi everyone. We're just waiting for a few more people to join uh, before we get started. Okay, let's kick off. Uh, thanks everyone for joining. My name is Mae Winfield. I'm the chair of BIM for Legal, uh, the organizers of this event today. BIM for Legal is a neutral forum for both lawyers and those who instruct them to try and um, upskill and learn more about the legal and contractual issues of BIM and related technologies. Uh, and we're very pleased today to have Sarah presenting about claims and disputes and how you can use BIM in them. I uh, have known Sarah a number of years through the international organization, the 4D Construction Group, um, where we um, deal with the more 4D elements of it. And I will let Sarah introduce herself. Sarah, over to you. Thank you, May. Um, I'm just going to turn off my camera to reserve the bandwidth. So good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to this talk on BIM in Claims and Disputes. Um, let me just move my slides. So um, I'm going to be talking about the benefits of using BIM, uh, that's building information models in claims and disputes as part of expert evidence. Um, I'll be discussing how HKA are seeing BIM come up in claims and what we can do with it when it does come up in claims um, to add value to the claim. And then we'll finish by uh, discussing some of the blockers and the challenges in using this type of evidence. So I'm Sarah Kite. I'm a senior consultant with HKA based in the London office. And I joined HKA around February last year about five weeks before lockdown. So um, my focus within the business is to analyze claims and disputes um, which have building information models. And I help other um, expert witnesses when a model is discussed in a claim. So it's, it's quite interesting work. Um, but I first heard about BIM back when I was studying for an architecture degree and I just so happened to sort of fall into construction um, through a part-time job. But the, the um, benefits in my architecture degree was quite heavily um, sort of 3D model driven. So that's coming quite useful uh, when transitioning into uh, this sort of work. Um, so HKA, what's great about working for them is um, they have lots of different uh, departments and sectors, which you can see on the screen. And as a result, um, I get to work with all of these sectors. And um, BIM is for everyone. And that's what's really interesting about it. It's, uh, it's just fascinating that you can, one day I'll be working with buildings, the next day I'll be working with delay and disruption. Um, and every, Every day is different, basically. So, on to BIM in claims. So, there are some obvious difficulties about discussing BIM in claims. And when we're trying to shed light on the legal issues relating to BIM in dispute resolution, none of us can behave like an open book. At least, that is, if we're actually interested in keeping our jobs. So none of us can talk openly or show specific examples of BIM claims publicly. And this is probably a good time to mention that the models and examples that I've used in this presentation, uh, presentation um, they're recreations of uh, issues that we've dealt with at HKA. Um, so it's not actually the evidence itself. And what really interests me in this sort of work is we have no idea what goes on behind closed doors. And awards and decisions from arbitrations, adjudications, negotiations, mediations, and other dispute resolution pathways are often private. So as quite a nosy person, I'm quite frustrated that we don't get to see it. We don't get to see what's being presented or how uh, BIM's being used. 
and you can't quantify it just yet. So um, for anyone on the call who doesn't know what BIM is, we will discuss it throughout. Um, so I've just picked up the definition from the ISO 19650 standard just here, about how uh, BIM is the use of a shared digital representation of a built asset. And obviously quite a lot of people say BIM is a process. So I'm going to focus a lot on the models, um, but obviously I'm aware that it's uh, very much about the process. So most of the conversations around BIM in the industry focus on using BIM preventatively. So we treat models like digital rehearsals for projects. We try and iron out the issues before we experience them on site. Um, so most people use BIM to avoid disputes. And I first used BIM uh, retrospectively to support a claim about five years ago for an adjudication. And I just thought it was really um, powerful how much, uh, how powerful the evidence was that we got from the model. So obviously it took a few years after that um, until uh, I was working in expert witness work. But expert witness work is entirely retrospective really um, we consider issues that have arisen in the past and uh, we're completely sort of beholden to the data we receive so we're always just uh, looking back really but obviously going back to working on this sort of work preventatively BIM has a lot of benefits um, to projects when it's used preventatively so I'm just going to flash some of them up on the screen. So it helps us improve our collaboration and communication. It gives us better pre-construction visualizations. Um, so we actually know what we're designing. and We can just visualize different options. Helps us create safer projects. Um, we can verify the design before we actually go for it and build it on site and just sort of iron out all those issues that might cause delays. Um, my speciality before I joined was 4D planning. So um, a combination of BIM and time that we're gonna come on to discuss later on in the presentation. And uh, it was 5D, which is sort of cost estimation, uh, prefabrication and uh, design for offsite manufacturing. Um, that was one of the most interesting things that I've been doing in the last couple of years before I joined Claims and operations and maintenance. So obviously one of the biggest benefits you have with BIM is being able to operate your facility much better using it. And when I first found out about, um, when I first started telling people um, that I was thinking about moving to uh, work sort of retrospectively with BIM, they just thought, isn't BIM that thing, that bright idea that was going to resolve all these disputes and make them all go away? And they were sort of incredulous when I said, well, I'm going to be looking at BIM when the ship sailed, when you're not going to be able to use any of the preventative benefits anymore. And so people were sort of puzzled about how BIM can be useful after the ship sailed and after um, a dispute has arisen. But working in this field, um, you quickly come to realize that building information models and the software used to create them and analyze them, they don't intrinsically tell you whether the design contained within them was created with reasonable skill and care, or whether the project, um, the design in the project will help meet a uh, project's fitness for purpose obligation, for example. There's no Microsoft paper chip, uh, paperclip equivalent that pops up to let you know when you've specified a product, uh, product that's unsuitable. Um, nothing tells you that, uh, say for example, an MEP designer or an architect is putting loads on the structure that are gonna make it deflect. Um, there's so many problems that can arise that just the models themselves, they won't tell you intrinsically. You have to check them and then you also have to check the design itself. So lots of things can go wrong. Um, there might be complex design changes, for example, there might 
if these scope changes, the contracts might not be clear. They might not be aligned through different members of the design team. Um, one party might have breached their obligations under the contract. There might be insolvencies, there might be non-payments, um, interoperability issues. You know, the list goes on and on. And so um, at HKA, we're still seeing plenty of disputes, which um, they've tried to use BIM to deliver their projects on time and on budget and to their quality targets. But somewhere along the line, the project became tangled up in a claim. And sometimes it's not anyone's fault, it just happens. But HKA have found that building information models themselves can often make really, really useful evidence. They can often tell us what happened, when it happened, whereabouts in the project it happened, um, how something happened. And they can, um, how to put this, uh, the project and the, say for example, looking at the common data environment and the correspondence, you can quite often see how project stakeholders behaved um, through BIM. So even, um, even when the models have stopped reflecting uh, what a design was supposed to be or what was constructed, that in itself can be telling. So even when BIM's been abandoned on a project, it can still be useful. Um, so one thing to note that lots of people don't really uh, appreciate when I tell them what I do is um, building information models themselves are hardly ever at the core of the dispute. So the models um, themselves, uh, they're just the medium through which we're seeing the perennial issues of say design or delay or quantum. Um, so uh, the claims and disputes discussed here are not only about BIM. Uh, BIM is kind of just a piece of the jigsaw, really. Um, sorry, I think I've missed a slide. There we go. OK, um, in this sort of line of work, quite often the evidence we're issued is just a total mess. Um, and that's not a comment on our clients. It's just sometimes the comments on the project, like there were loads of changes. Um, it could be anything, but there's vast amounts of data to go through, and we have to quite often um, go through it in a very short amount of time. So um, models and common data environments can really help uh, sort of navigate um, project data. But the models themselves really help because they avoid working with lots of different drawings. And as a result, um, if we get issued models, uh, we can do some forensic investigation work in the models themselves. So I quite like to think of myself as a sort of crime scene investigator. Um, I like to think that I'm looking at uh, a crime scene after the fact, and I'm looking at the evidence and what, even though both parties are kind of denying any wrongdoing, just looking exactly at the scene and trying to figure out what we can ascertain from it. So that sounds quite glamorous, but unfortunately, um, my job quite often is more like being a taxi driver. So um, because the models, the lens through which we're seeing the claims and disputes, and because the disputes are quite often outside my sort of area of expertise, so say for example, um, process engineering disputes, um, they sort of look like sausages in space to me, but uh, all I have to do in those sort of instances is drive around other experts and um, sort of navigate them to the issues that they want to look at in a project design. And essentially, I just sit and watch the meter run while they stop and look at these landmarks. But to get to the point, where I can drive them around the models. Um, I've quite often spent a significant amount of time sort of collecting this data and analyzing it so it's easy for them to go through. Often this involves downloading uh, the models 
And um, so on the right of the screen, you can see that I've renamed some models and federated them into um, an analysis software. And I filed them into the date that they were created um, or uploaded onto the common data environment. So say, for example, that tells us when that data was being relied on. Um, after that, uh, I take um, we do an analysis usually on my own and I take viewpoints and I start to write the report. Um, but one of the benefits of working in this process is I can start to sort of make the models what I think my boss calls idiot proof. So quite often um, I can set an expert up with a free viewing software like Nervousworks Freedom. Um, or sometimes we use online portals so they don't even need to download a separate piece of software they can just use their browser and clicking on the viewpoints that i've set up for them and cleverly naming them um so say for example on the right you can see i've separated them into delay events um i can help navigate the experts to particular points in time that i think they'd want to see so having done this sort of work for over a year now um, I've been able to identify some of the trends and patterns in the projects that I've worked on, which I'm hoping the um, BIM for Legal community might be interested in. And uh, I'm just going to caveat that before I go ahead and say, obviously, I don't have um, all of the industry's data, so I can't paint a picture of what everyone else is seeing. I can only really say what I'm seeing. But here's what I know. So in the last 12, uh, sorry, 13 months now, um, I've been issued well over 10,000 models. Um, and these have been created as early as 2011. And these models have been created or edited in over 12 different software packages. And luckily for me, um, I have the benefit of analyzing and comparing this data against data collected in HKA's Crux report. Um, so the Crux report analyzes claims and disputes um, in over 1,100 projects from 80 different countries. So the benefit of this is it's really helped me um, get a picture of the wider state of the industry and then give me something to compare it to when I'm just looking specifically at BIM. So in terms of the projects I'm looking at and the sector breakdown that they fall in, um, I look, uh, I really thought before I joined that I'd be looking at more buildings projects. Um, so I've been focusing on buildings probably most of my career in construction. Um, so I find that quite interesting. Um, in terms of how that compares to the wider, uh, the wider company, um, there are some trends. So, uh, say for example, you could see buildings um, not far off. Um, I've been really surprised to see a lot more sort of process engineering disputes um, and models within that, just simply because I hadn't actually seen them before I joined uh, the world of disputes. I had no idea that BIM adoption was so big in that sector of the industry. Um, so this graph looks at uh, the uh, primary causes of claims and disputes where um, BIM is included in uh, the claim. So um, the top causes of BIM disputes, or should I say disputes that involve BIM, are really not BIM. Um, it's never about the model. It's always about the design change um, and the sort of issues around delay or contract interpretation, for example. So again, just to drill it in, none of these claims are primarily about BIM. Um, we're yet to see a single claim where the primary cause of dispute um, is BIM. So that's quite interesting to a few people. Um, so it's unsurprising to me how uh, contract interpretation issues um, issue, sorry, contract interpretation issues um, feature quite heavily in what I do. Um, 
think lots of people on the call will have seen contracts that say things like do BIM and achieve BIM level two. Um, contract, is, uh, contract interpretation issues also come out of perhaps having, I don't want to say too much detail, but they're rather a result of having con uh, conflicting contract obligations. Um, so that's quite interesting. Um, so BIM might be mentioned as an alleged breach of contract as a sort of subpart of a claim, but it's never the primary um, focus of what we're looking at. Um, so just to compare that against um, the sort of general crux data um, for the wider business. Um, So some some of these uh, top issues, they I don't see um, any BIM related disputes which feature these issues that you're seeing on the screen right now at all. So um, perhaps you'd hope, for example, if BIM was used well at tender stage, then your bills of quantities would be accurate. So it's perhaps unsurprising that the bottom um, issue you see there isn't actually included in these types of claims. So in non-related, uh, in non-BIM related issues, um, my colleagues throughout the globe work on a fairly mixed bag of um, dispute resolution pathways. And uh, you're seeing things like mediation and negotiation gaining in popularity. But most of what I do is arbitrations um, and a few adjudications. And um, what's interesting about that, so for the adjudications, you don't get long to work on the claims. Um, so you don't get to delve into as much detail. Um, sorry, I've missed a point on the last slide. Um, I would say we have heard a few hints of litigations and um, I think the problem with that is perhaps they've been sort of curtailed by uh, COVID, but um, at the moment we're not seeing them spring into life and I'm not sure if they will. Um, so not a week goes by in this line of work where someone doesn't mention uh, Tron Engineering v Mott McDonald. Um, and so for those of you who are unfamiliar, uh, this is a BIM litigation where the consultant essentially locked the digital doorway to the commendator environment. Um, and in my mind, uh, this doesn't really represent the wider industry of BIM in claims. So in my mind, this is just an intellectual property dispute. So that's a summary of how HKA has seen BIM um, relating to claims. So I'm going to move on to look at how um, BIM can uh, facilitate a claim. So we do um, usually one of three things in projects. We either help clients view models um, and help them see what's inside of these models. Uh, most of my life is spent analysing models and helping other experts um, sort of analyse these models. So assisting uh, lots of different experts in lots of different uh, project sectors, as we've discussed earlier. And in very rare circumstances, um, we can create models. So we've done this a few times where a project's come in and it's not actually had any models, or at least the project had models, but the party that we're um, assisting haven't been issued those models. Um, so that's quite an interesting service just for um, if we want to visualize something can be really useful to sort of aid a claim. Um, in those instances, pictures are worth a thousand words, but at the same time, the services like viewing, um, they're also really useful. So I had a lawyer um, come to me last week saying he was on the brink of buying a £5,000 licence, just a viewer model that was mentioned in the statement of claim. Again, just viewing information. That's a really simple service and um, 
you, if you're just trying to understand a project, you can just view a model and use that to your understanding. So for experts, it means it spends less time, uh, instead of looking at thousands of different drawings, if I set them up with a model so they can view it, they spend less time learning about the project and more time analyzing it. So we often use models to search for relevant data to a claim. So say, for example, models can help us find data much faster um, than we can find them um, relevant data looking at drawings. So quite a lot of you in the BIM community will probably be looking at this and thinking, well, this is money for old rope. Um, this really isn't hard to do. And I have no defense to that. It, it's very simple, but it's very effective. And then after we found relevant evidence in models, we can then use it in our reports as evidence. So um, imagine what this would look like if it was a drawing. You'd need at least 15 different drawings and sections um, to look through this. But one model um, really paints a picture. So in terms of the analysis that we do, um, typically in a design change analysis, which is uh, usually the most, it's probably the most common um, analysis I'm doing at the moment. Um, my boss uh, once said, we're, all, we're always looking for one of three changes or a mixture of both. Um, the changes to scope, layout and specification. So um, that's a really interesting way of viewing things. Um, just because say, for example, you can see a layout change on the screen. And if I went into the model, um, this example uh, that this is based on, uh, if you click on it, you see a change in specification as well. Um, but you've obviously got to go in and navigate the model to find that out. And it's not easy to see on the drawings. Um, so again, just going back to uh, design change analysis, um, in this project, uh, I was actually asked to look through uh, thousands of drawings and mark them up. And um, the expert didn't actually know that there was any models issued. So instead of, sort of getting to work at marking up these drawings, I asked what the um, relevant P and ID, um, the little number for the schematic, um, I would need if we wanted to find um, all of the uh, pipelines that we needed to look at in a model. And so we very quickly wrote a code which helped us find all the different pipelines for this project. And um, again, we can use uh, sort of viewpoints and search sets and selection sets to sort of save um, the points in time and the points in evidence that we want to come back to at a later date. We can add to that. Um, this was really, really useful. I think this is the sort of turning point in when we realized exactly how powerful this evidence can be. And again, um, just an example of what that looks like. So on the left is an earlier revision of some of the pipelines that we found. And on the right is um, a revision of the design after a variation had happened and exactly what had been added. And again, more of the same. So um, a lot of what I do is just sort of um, showing models at different revisions at different stages in time. And again, more like that. So in terms of how we do this, um, you can compile multiple revisions of models um, in the same model. So you can collect the evidence you need into one single, uh, one single model. Unfortunately, I can't show you any of these. Um, and I just couldn't replicate it in the time that I had. So um, you're just going to have to trust me on this. But um, they are really, really valuable when it's coming uh, when it comes to sort of working through all the evidence um, really quickly when you're working with lots of different experts. Um, and the good thing about this is, as every month goes by, we're seeing more and more models being issued in evidence. So it, it's sort of speeding up how we're looking at projects. So um, moving on to one of the other things I'm often asked to do, 
is I'm often asked to give an opinion as to whether a model met the right level of detail or level of development or level of information uh, requirements. And um, on some projects, especially very big projects, um, clients have actually drawn their own um, requirements up, which don't actually match any of the rest of the industry. Um, so that's quite interesting. And um, for those of you who are very, very annoyed that I've just used some out-of-date uh, terminology, um, you have to keep in mind that disputes uh, have time lags and it can quite often uh, be quite historic what we're looking at. So lots of my, um, what my, I and my colleagues look at are references to old standards. Um, and hopefully the ISO 19650 um, adoption will reduce some of the ambiguities in the older standards that are sort of contributing to claims and disputes at the moment. But just keep in mind, um, if you are interested in doing this sort of work, you have to be a bit of a historian, um, not only with standards, but also with software and hardware as well. Um, so moving on, clash detection. Um, quite often use class detection to look at how coordinated a design was at particular times in a project. And um, time is obviously money. So any clashes um, that cause delays, uh, we're interested in seeing. And uh, what we can do with that is sort of look at different clash reports throughout different stages of the project. So say, for example, uh, here, we've got the first revision and um, I find this quite funny. Um, someone's obviously tried to help, but it's still not exactly resolved at the next revision. Um, oh, apologies, I slipped ahead. Um, and then the third image I've got at the bottom there is just an access zone. Um, so that's not actually a physical object, but someone's gone ahead and modeled that zone and said, I need that zone for maintenance. And then someone's gone and ran some ducks through it. So um, the interesting thing about this is, um, in my mind, you probably should have reasonably known if you were looking at other um, models that you shouldn't be running ducks through there. So um, again, it's what was uh, what sh you should reasonably have known at the time. Now, um, level of effort claims are quite popular. So when a design change has occurred, um, and perhaps there's a, a discrepancy in the timesheets about how long it should have taken to implement a change. Um, what we quite often do is just look at the different um, number of objects that relate to that change. So in this completely fictitious change here, um, imagine these are lights. An expert might agree with their opposing expert that every new object here is um, uh, worth 15 minutes of a BIM technician's life. So say, for example, once you've got that, you can say, well, every additional object is 15 minutes, and then that equates to a cost. So that's quite simple to do, and it's quite popular. Um, this is really important, um, but it's quite often something that we're not asked for very often. But if parties on a project didn't adhere to the naming conventions they'd agreed to, um, the most obvious consequence is the information management on a project can be an absolute nightmare. It can take significantly longer for um, everyone to find the data that they're looking for. Um, so this is a sort of potential breach of contract that can come up. And I'm seeing it a few times um, in the projects that we're looking at. So again, hopefully um, ISO 19650 and just making this clear and just as time moves on, hopefully these things will, will just sort of iron themselves out. Now, uh, one, of, uh, one of the things that we've done quite successfully with common data environments is looking at exactly what happened on a project. So lots of projects in their BIM execution plans have different um, different requirements about how often you need to upload a model. So that's a really interesting um, uh, feature that we can look at, is just looking at how often uh, different people were actually adhering to um, their contract requirements. Who followed the plan? Um, 
And finally, in this section, I'm just going to move on to 4D very quickly. So um, quick plug for the 4D construction groups that May mentioned earlier. Um, if you want to learn about 4D, I suggest visiting uh, our website. Our mission is just to improve um, the uptake of 4D modelling and construction. And um, if you don't know what 4D is, it's essentially just a combination of building information models and construction schedules. So on the scene, uh, sorry, on the screen, you're seeing a screenshot from a very popular piece of software called Synchro. Um, they're not the only provider, but uh, you can bring in um, programs from Primavera, Aster, MS Project. You can import lots of different file formats, so it's quite versatile. And um, so before I joined HKA, I was a planner and I loved 4D for its preventative benefits. So when I was contacting my former colleagues to get permission to use this image, um, I asked how the project was going and they described it. And I pictured exactly what was going on in my mind because 4D just really helps you visualize your projects so you can plan, uh, plan them a lot better. But they're also really useful in claims. So um, if we think about 4D for dispute resolution, we can compare different sorts of um, uh, different, different aspects of a claim. So say, for example, we've got the baseline dates versus actual dates to do an as planned versus as built analysis. Um, and one thing that's quite interesting in this sort of evidence is I've seen a lot of firms actually, um, they've been presenting uh, visualizations created in animation software that aren't actually critically path managed. Um, so it's easy to make mistakes when it's not critically path managed because it's not actually related to a program. Whereas if you're using 4D technology, everything's uh, related to a task. Um, so if you think about the delay and disruption protocol um, from the Society of Construction Law, um, think about all the different possibilities of how you could use this. So instead of just um, as planned versus as built, you could potentially do um, as planned versus time impact analysis. Um, or a popular one um, is looking at two different expert witnesses reports. So common differences um, between the two different experts reports might be the um, beliefs about the dates, um, the as-built dates, or they might have wildly different views on the critical path. Um, so that's what it looks like in reality. And you might compare two different visions of a program. And the keen-eyed construction managers across uh, the viewers are probably going to notice that there's no um, uh, facade panels left out for the hoist here. So again, uh, you might just want to comment on something like that. And the level of detail you go down into in this, um, you can do it, uh, you can take snapshots every month or every hour. It just depends what you want to show. You can put lots of different types of evidence in these claims. So you can make a sort of one-stop shop for your evidence if you want to. And uh, this is just some evidence from uh, Freeform, who are a 4D consultancy and our friends within the uh, 4D construction group. Um, I'm just going to run through this very quickly, but they are um, they make much better looking models than I tend to make. So finally, um, just to wrap up, because I'm very conscious of time, um, we're going to look at some of the blockers and obstacles to using BIM in this sort of evidence. Um, so perhaps the biggest problem with COVID that I've experienced is when I'm issued huge quantities of data and I have to access it, usually means downloading it. Um, and a domestic internet connection isn't exactly fantastic for that. Um, so I've been quite lucky in that I got special sort of dispensation to go into the office. Um, but lots of my clients are struggling to move large data volumes around. Um, and many are struggling to sort of do so from the comfort of their own homes. So um, international clients quite often want to send me uh, external hard drives. But um, again, it's not like a postal service would be much faster. Um, another blocker. Um, so um, once upon a time, an expert um, from the quantum team came up to me. He said that um, an opposing expert report had got a 5D analysis in it. Um, 
And I asked exactly what software they were using or how they'd gone about um, sort of taking the quantities from the model and didn't discuss their process and they were refusing to share it, saying that it was their intellectual property and they really didn't want to um, share their model. So um, it was quite difficult to get around, but then the issue just went away. Um, so luckily um, I didn't have to deal with that, but I'm thinking it's probably going to be more prevalent in the future. And um, again, I've discussed this earlier, so I'm going to go over it very briefly. Um, you have to think about the time lags and uh, the fact that these are quite often historic disputes. So um, the BIM technicians on the call, you're going to be familiar. If you've worked with old models, you have to upgrade them. Um, and this takes quite a while sometimes. And you might want to use a batch utility service. Uh, so on the screen, I've got um, a plugin called Cherry BIM. Um, but how do you know this isn't affecting your data? And technology improves over time. So if you opened a 2014 Revit model in um, you know, the latest version, can you really say for sure that what you're seeing now is exactly what you would have seen in 2014? Um, when you're getting cross-examined over that, if it comes to that, then, you know, how are you really sure? And finally, um, common data environments are quite often closed after a project's complete. So prudent parties have quite often downloaded their models, but sometimes this data has been moved around or renamed and nobody's checked where these models, um, if they're still open. And sometimes um, lawyers like to move evidence around into different folders. Um, and they might pick up the wrong revision of a file and put it in the wrong evidence folder. Um, this also means that your links are missing in your Revit model. Um, so you have to go back and relink things. But you might not be able to do that with confidence if you don't really know where everything's come from. And again, just here, um, looking at uh, different models with the exact same name shoved in the same file. Um, you're really going to have to make a lot of effort to work out which one's which. So that's one of the blockers. But obviously, um, you can overcome this just by uh, working really hard and spending loads of time and money doing it. Um, so it's up to you if you actually want to utilize that. Um, it's just that's entirely avoidable if you have the option of keeping your common data environment open. Um, that's it from me. Um, that's the entirety of the presentation. So I'm hoping uh, there are some questions. Um, yes, we, we have lots of questions. <laughs> um, okay. So I'm just going to go through a few. Um, so there's a question that many organizations rarely apply BIM for mega projects since it's hard to implement for infra projects. But then how does BIM and claims reduce costs for parties? Um, so if you're not if you're not applying BIM, how how is BIM and claims helping reduce costs? Well, say for example, um, again in this sort of instance, you might have to create a model, um, which, as I said earlier, we don't often do. But when we do, it's quite often very effective. So say for example, if you um, this isn't uh, unfortunately if they haven't implemented BIM, you can't use their models. Um, so yeah. That one's a difficult one. I don't know, May, you might have a better answer for that than I do. Um, I, I think with the, it depends what you want to do with BIM. I've seen BIM used in um, adjudications where uh, 4D BIM was used to show where the, um, where the delay occurred. So where the critical path all went wrong. Uh, and, or you, you can, but then you have to create a model from the information available uh, and so it's not just where you already have a BIM model from construction you can use it to sh to prove where something went wrong or indeed what people should have done to save costs and time uh, or make it a better quality or uh, improve health and safety so it's, it's going back to the BIM basics I think yeah um, another one is which software do you use for generating BIM and claims? Are they accepted by courts and expert witnesses? Um, so 
most of what I do at the moment um, is in Navisworks. And in terms of um, whether it's accepted, at the moment, um, mainly if you have to, uh, you can submit it, but they're not going to be able to open it. So you're going to have to video um, what you want to show. And it's, it's a bit of a, it's a bit of a, a sort of wasted opportunity, in my opinion. Um, in the future, I'd love for arbitrators, for example, to be able to sort of navigate their own way around a building information model. Um, you know, sort of a pipe dream um, where I sort of make myself redundant, really. <laughs> Quite interesting. But um, yeah, I'm, I'm thinking, uh, yeah, at the moment, it's just videos um, compressing images down into reports, which are still powerful. Um, say, for example, the images that I've shown, you'll be able to see that they're much better than just marking up hundreds of drawings. Um, but yeah, I think it's a wasted opportunity at the moment. It'd be nice if we could actually use the native software to take um, different courts and different tribunals around the models. Um, would you turn your camera on, Sarah? Just oh, so yeah, people can see you whilst, whilst I'm not saying. Uh, um, I thought I had got it on. I might have to turn off. Uh, can you see me yet? Yes. Um, on that, I would say from my experience um, doing disputes as a lawyer, generally courts will accept any form of evidence. The thing is you may need to bring in the computers with the software uh, for them to view it uh, or explain to them how it works and take them through it. And the problem, I suppose, with that is you will then have to explain to the lawyers uh, what you're doing. So yeah. it's it, it could get, as you say, quite messy if you're not just using videos, but there, there's only the possibility of it. Yeah, I um, mean, if you, if you think about how worthwhile it is, um, I mean, something that springs to mind is I actually did jury duty, so criminal, um, criminal uh, investigation, sorry, criminal cases, um, it's about five years ago. The printer was running out of ink, so some poor man's life um, hung on the balance of whether you know the printer was going to work that day. So, in obviously that's a criminal case, but in civil cases when it's high value claims, it is worthwhile just bringing your laptop. Um, so I think probably need to get better as at this as an industry. Hopefully that will change over time. Um, obviously presenting evidence interactively, like um, uh, we have a tribunal. Um, going on at the moment through zoom um so an arbitration so yeah there's there's no reason that we shouldn't be able to share our screen exactly like we do um with other sorts of reports i think one of the things with bim um if you agree is that it's so compelling it's very hard to explain to someone how say a judge who's not necessarily a construction specialist about something but then he sees this image and all of the movement and it 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 makes so much more sense to someone who who doesn't look at drawing say every day mm, absolutely and um i mean a picture really is just worth a thousand words and then obviously a moving picture um so 40 is wor worth a lot more words i'd like to think so another question is about digital twins um, if you have comments about the potential for digital twins to to benefit in this area, um, I haven't really thought about it to be honest, because so much of what we do is so retrospective. Um, you know, I feel bad because I, I've read the ISO nineteen six fifty standard, but I just don't get to think about it that much. Um, I think. I'm probably going to see digital twins at some point when someone says, oh, I want a digital twin, and then they don't say what they want within that. So that's going to be quite interesting. Um, but honestly, I just haven't thought about it. Again, May, you, you might have a better answer for this. I think probably with digital twins, because they are the current, the, the, is the information passing back and forth, where you probably slightly in future where you have existing digital twins, they could be used in dispute because again, a digital twin will disclose when the, the heating, the, the water supply, all the way a built asset functions. And if something went wrong, say you have a massive leak, the digital twin could say someone didn't do the maintenance when the digital twin told them to. 
So again, it it could be used as evidence in the way anything in the way a say photograph would be. Um, but the problem now is we don't have that many digital twins, and as you say, it's not really a retrospective type um, thing. It's something that you create at the time, so slightly different from being wet, which you can do both ways. Yeah. Um, another question is, sorry, they're quite wordy. Um, is there a hierarchy in priority of information? Because where there's conflicting information between the drawing, the specifications, the models, so how do you navigate that when you're doing claims and disputes? Um, so it's a mixture, really. So. Um, a few times I've had a claim sort of come in and I've read the statement of claim and the statement of defence and um, the lawyers have actually forgotten or they don't know that, um, say, for example, a BIM execution plan exists. Um, so in terms of a hierarchy, um, I just look at things that I think you should be looking at. So start with the contract, start with the sort of claims documents and then um, that quite often sort of carves a pattern for what you need to look at. Um, models quite useful, obviously, um, from this. Uh, common data environments, if you can sort of visualise exactly what happened in the common data environment, that's very useful. Um, but the claim itself will probably tell you where to go and what you need to look at. And the experts will also um, know what to look at. So uh, say, for example, if it's process engineering, you'll be looking at lots of schematics alongside the drawings and just making sure that there's not sort of conflicting um, data. I think one thing with that is it depends on what goes back to the contract. A lot of BIM documentation isn't in the contracts. And as you say, the lawyers probably don't know a BEP exists or the EII exists. There's a lot of I think projects going on still, which are very much BIM enabled, but none of the actual chunky documents are binding. So you then mm -hmm. have that weird position. You have a dispute where you're arguing about something that isn't mentioned in the contract, um, mm -hmm. and it gets very, very messy. Yeah, hundred <laughs> percent. There's a question. Um, so can you make a claim against those who? name documents correctly even though it's written in the EIR? Um, I mean that's not up for me to say. Um, my job as an expert or assisting experts as I'm usually doing, I just say what's happened. Um, I can't really give advice on what you should be claiming about. So again that's going to be a May question. Um, it again it goes back to what's what's um, contractually binding. Um, if you imagine the EIR is a contractually binding document on that party, you would say yes, you breach your contractual obligations because you didn't do what the EIR told you to. There would then be the second question of what loss or damage flowed from that. You didn't do, you didn't name them correctly, therefore this happened. You had a delay of six months be before someone noticed it. It always goes back to not just what someone did, but what the consequences were. Uh, it's, it's not just enough that someone did something wrong. Um, yeah, but I mean, it's pretty, lots of the things you see, they're pretty foreseeable that that's going to become an issue. Um, I think that's always quite telling um, when you're looking at these sort of like sort of micro breaches, you might want to say, like, it doesn't seem like a big deal. But if a document controller is then having to, um, you know, QA reject and other people aren't getting that information in time, then that's, yeah, I can imagine it, there being sort of um, claims around that. Um, I mean, I've seen claims around that, but they're always sub claims and just sort of, um, they're not the actual main claim. They're just sort of um, perennial uh, other additional um, things that perhaps act as evidence that someone didn't. Uh, you know, achieve the right standard of care that they should have done. So a couple of last ones. Um, someone asked, the SEL doesn't mention BIM in delay analysis. So are there other standards which set out using BIM in delay analysis or are you slightly ahead of your time? Um, 
So in terms of BIM and delay analysis, um, so BIM and visualization, um, uh, our friend uh, Dr. David John Gibbs probably did the most useful research around this. I'm trying to think when he started it, it was around 2000 and maybe 13, I want to say. Um, so it's worth going to look at his research on this um, in terms of what's been possible. And it's been possible for quite a long time. Um, so again, in, in terms of, okay, the SEL might not mention this. Um, I can't think of anyone else who really does talk about it. Um, maybe the CIOB, I think I've seen something from them. But um, again, DJ's research has been out for a while. Um, so we've seen the potential for a while, just a case of uh, maybe writing this up. Um, maybe this is something that someone could write a dissertation about. Definitely. Um, I'll do two last ones. One is um, capabilities of the supply chain member delivering BIM. Is that ever something that you've seen brought into question and analysed as part of a dispute? Um, Sometimes people have signed up for it and um, they maybe shouldn't have. Um, I haven't actually seen it at HKA. I remember it from the industry. Um, so times where, um, uh, you know, a subcontractor from a small electrical firm, for example, has, has signed up to some obligations. They didn't actually know what they were si signing up to. Um, so I've seen it in industry. I'm yet to see it in a claim. Um, but again, that's probably reflective of the sort of claims that we're working with. Um, so yeah, it's probably there, but I'm, I'm not seeing it. Um, a good one to end with is, does adopting BIM help resolve claims before they escalate into a dispute? Uh, yes, um, I'd like to think so. Um, otherwise, what are we all doing this for? So. Um, the most value that you can get out of both BIM and 4D is um, through adopting it at, as early as possible, really. Um, so if you, for example, if you leave it too late, there's just no point. Um, I worked on a project a few years ago where they had already started procuring um, and they were almost finished procuring before they did their um, uh, 4D model. And it was just too late. By the time you found out the temporary work schedule didn't work, it was about, it was about a year too late, really. Um, so adopt it as early as possible. Um, I mean, COVID's been great uh, in terms of lots of people being on furlough and potentially learning new skills. So you'd hope that um, the industry is going to get better with this. Um, yeah, I hope that's an all right answer. <laughs> No, it's, it's, and you are very right. I think with BIM, you things come up earlier. So mm -hmm. rather than getting to site and having a late um, issue or late variation, people realize it hopefully months in advance. Um, so that is one of the benefits or you know whose fault it is. So you don't pay lawyers a lot of money to work that one out. Yeah, um, I mean, the, the, best, the best description I've ever heard um, of BIM being described as is a digital rehearsal. So it's sort of like a dress rehearsal. Um, you know, everyone shows up in this digital environment and says what space they need. And um, you know when they're gonna come in and you know how they're gonna behave. It, it, just, it just works really well at preventing disputes if you use it correctly. Um, though obviously if you don't use it correctly, then you, you're probably gonna end up in one. So we've run out of time. Um, I say for to attendees, we will try and answer the various other questions offline. If you uh, if you aren't part of our mailing list yet, if you email bimforlegal at gmail.com, we'll add you and we'll let you know when um, where you can find the answers. And I understand the recording of this will be available um, and the UK BIM Alliance uh, will have that. And just left to say thank you, Sarah. That was an amazing presentation. I learned a lot. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you, everybody.